this month. A double-handed sleigh ride south. Bring on the tropics! How the radical New America's cup boat will work. Potentially over 50 knots. How to race without getting your feet wet. A live final in Sarasota. And the youth worlds in China. Ah, I know, we have a bad start. But first, as the Volvo Ocean Race fleet rolled into Cape Town, thoughts turned to the fearsome Southern Ocean. It's a secret. <laughs> and the 6,500 miles that lay ahead. Leg two of the Volvo Ocean Race from Lisbon to Cape Town had been tough. For the new crew, this was their longest time at sea by far. For navigators, the 19-day leg had been intense and stressful. We're just off uh, the Brazilian coast, probably 400 miles. There's been a little bit of a high pressure ridge and um, it's forcing us a little bit further to the west. A bit of snakes and ladders, a bit of back and forth, a bit of bungee cord, you know. Conditions are constantly changing, especially here in these trade winds where it can easily go from 10, 10 to 20 knots of wind. The race south to the equator from Lisbon had been close. The fleet barely out of sight of each other. Once in the Southern Hemisphere, a large area of light winds ahead blocked their path, forcing the fleet to stay west. So sort they of can't shake them off at the moment, they keep coming at us, you know. But that's all right. Good, um, good two-boat testing. Every time they've come within distance, we've let them get away, so we're determined to keep them this time. Timing the turn to the east would be critical. You fought so hard, being off the pace, to stay in the game, no one just make a rash decision and throw it away, so... It's... Yeah, it's a difficult time. How do you think, really think we should drive? OK, let's drive. Yeah. OK, we're going to drive, how do you think? Decision made, driving. When they did, the reach across the South Atlantic provided a soaking, high-speed taste of the infamous Southern Ocean. The tactical challenge off the South American coast had seen Mapfre come out on top as they led into Cape Town. Super happy this is, uh, you know, for us the uh, first leg was very good already, being second in Lisbon, but of course he's winning here and winning the first big, uh, you know, long leg is uh, very happy, very proud of. Behind them, Dong Feng heaved a sigh of relief, having pulled themselves back from fourth after tripping up at the turn to take second. Tonight second place after what happened, made a big mistake. We did complicated thing to take the lead and we just saw the stupid thing. Next across the line was Vestas 11th Hour Racing taking third. From here, the focus turned to leg four. 6,500 miles from Cape Town to Melbourne, Australia, across the wastes of the Southern Ocean. I never sailed in the Southern Ocean, it will be the first time, so I'm quite anxious and nervous. Uh, never experienced so much cold that I think I will experience now. So I hope that I'm ready, all my kit is ready, and I will trust, trust on that. All the people told me that the South Ocean is hard, but it's amazing too. I know that it's sometimes it's dangerous because of the strong condition, but I think that I'm in a experienced team, so I'm safety with them. So. I'm not worried about this, but yes, I have a little uh, tip that I, I'll tell you in Australia, <laughs> not now. <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> As they contemplated what lay ahead, some took time to visit the first key landmark of the leg, the Cape of Good Hope. Certainly leaving the loved ones and, and mum and, and talking to them the last time before you head off to a, a leg like this, it's... Um, Oh, yeah, you do have second thoughts about what you're going through, what you're putting them through, at the same time as yeah, you're doing the thing you love and everyone's always saying make sure you wear your harness, be safe, wear your life jacket and, and those are the things that are going through your head when you're going through these manoeuvres and you're up on the foredeck with your harness on, your life jacket on, you make sure you clip on because you, you literally hear that coming through your head that um, someone in the back of your mind saying be safe because yeah, it does get pretty ropey up there. Bom, eu acho que essa perna vai ser é, muito mais dura do que do que a outra perna que a gente fez e é, vai ser um desafio mental 
sanidade física e mental, de, de né, conviver a bordo com condições tão extremas. E para mim vai ser é uma das pernas mais icônicas da, né, da, da, do, do oceano do sul, onde, no mar, mar austral, onde, onde grandes velejadores são forjados. Be told by all the veterans, all the legends, just this is going to be the hardest leg that I'll ever do. Going straight into this leg, knowing that it's going to be cold, it's going to be wet, it's going to be a lot of hard work and not much sleep. The Southern Ocean's kind of got this ominous feel about it, but you don't really know what it's going to be like until you're there. As the start loomed, the tension built as the weather predictions filtered through. Leg three is shaping up right now to be a true, proper Southern Ocean leg. Uh, the Cape Town exit is not too dissimilar to what we had last time that we were here. So there's no easing into leg three. It's full on, straight from the beginning. These guys will be 30 to 40 knots at times. Uh, everything that you hear about the Southern Ocean for big breeze, big waves, cold air, cold water, it's all going to be there, and it's all going to be straight in their face, right from the beginning. And it was. The opening conditions were just as brutal as the forecast suggested, as the fleet punched its way upwind. But there was far more to come. A weather bomb was developing astern as vicious winds of 40 to 60 knots driving 10 to 15 meter seas approached from behind. Join us next month to find out how the fleet fared. Oman played host to the 2017 Formula Kite World Championships, where 58 riders from 22 countries and six continents took part in the six-day event. In winds that ranged from 6 to 20 knots, France's Nico Parlier dominated the men's class with a near-perfect display to take the championship title. American sailor Daniela Moroz took the women's title, winning 21 of her 26 races. Three-time kite surfing speed world champion Alexandre Cazergue has broken his own world record. Hitting just a fraction off 58 knots, the French kite surfer claimed the new record during the 2017 Sultan Speed event held in Salin de Giraud, France. Swiss team Alinghi took victory in the final event of the 2017 Extreme Sailing Series in Los Cabos, Mexico. But their victory wasn't sufficient to overhaul Danish-flagged SAP Extreme Sailing Team, who took the overall season title by just two points. When the new cup holders unveiled plans for the next America's Cup boat, the sailing world drew breath. A 75-foot-long monohull with no keel, flying on foils. As the radical concept sank in, questions arose. So the World Sailing Show went to a renowned cup expert to find answers. It's bold, it's radical, it's exciting. Technically, it's really exciting. And it'll be really challenging for the sailors to sail it, you know, because they've ne just never sailed a boat like that before. Grant Simmer has won the America's Cup four times, including the historic race in 1983, when Australia too ended America's 132-year winning streak. A key player both at Alinghi and then Oracle Racing, he knows what winning looks like. He's the man you'd want in your team. And for this cup, the British have got him. So just how radical is the new design? It can go up to 50 knots and, and potentially over 50 knots. It's a 75-foot monohull without a keel. The boards on either side of the boat we think they're going to weigh 1.2 to 1.5 tonne. The beam of the boat, about 5.4 metres. And then, potentially, you could be 15 metres, you know, with your boards out either side. Five metre draft with the, with the boards down at dock, if you had both boards down. Normally, a, a boat like this would be, have displacement in the order of 35 tonne, maybe. And this thing's only going to weigh 7 tonne, you know. So, uh, it's, yeah. How will the new boat be powered? We couldn't manually provide enough power to be able to camp the foils in and out. 
the canting mechanism, the pump and the electronics to drive that system will be standard and that will be powered by a, ba a battery pack. How can a 75-foot monohull be faster than a 50-foot cat? Why is it so fast? Because it's got a lot of riding moment and it's only got a rudder foil and a, a board, a T-foil, in the water. What makes it powerful is this foil is sticking out to leeward. In rough terms, a riding moment is from the centre of lift of that foil, which would be about at the T-junction. The CG of the boat is creating that riding moment, so it's half the beam plus another three metres out there. Your riding arm's pretty damn big. And you've got a foil sticking out to windward, which weighs one, one and a half tonne. But perhaps one of the biggest challenges comes from the simplest task. We've been looking at what boats we should focus on sailing, just for our sailors to get used to sailing a boat like the New America's Cup class, and, uh, and really we haven't found, <laughs> haven't found anything yet. Still to come, how one man took on the world and won. Plus, the youth worlds in China. But first, how a double-handed race south delivered a major victory in the Class 40 Championship. There were mixed emotions at the end of the Transac Jacques Vab when Phil Sharp and Pablo Santorde crossed the finish line in Salvador de Bahia. They had led for 12 of the 17-day race from France to Brazil. At one point, they had more than a 40-mile lead and had set a new personal boat speed best of 25.5 knots. None of this was enough to win, at least not in this race. Yet taking a podium position did allow them to clinch the overall Class 40 season trophy. We are racing! But success hadn't come easily. Uh, last night was, was tiring. The satellite system is basically just completely stopped working. The good news is that we're leading. Yay! Uh, we're starting to catch up on a little bit of sleep now. We've had a big problem in that we can't get access to any weather files at the moment. If we can't get weather, then it's going to be a very tricky passage um, and strategy approaching the doldrums and later on. But there were more glitches in store. We have a problem, Houston. It's not a good one. No gas comes out. That means cold tea, cold porridge, um, and cold food. I enjoyed, but it was one of the wildest nights ever for me, sailing. And to be fair, I'm, I'm waiting for the wind to, to drop a little bit, to, to be able to relax and Keeping their show on the road was a priority. Our electronic nightmares continue. We had the autopilot basically pack up last night. So um, that's that's a big deal to try and resolve. We got the spinnaker up in 30 knots, so just in the edge. Right on the edge. Then another set of hurdles. We decided to have a look at the keel and there was uh, an enormous clump of weed on the keel. That was, that was slowing our boat all the way through last night and we had to stop the boat, reverse the boat and then I had to jump in the water and it's difficult to come to terms with the fact that we've been working really hard on uh, building up this cushion and now we've got to start all over again. Next, a breakage. So I just noticed a small problem with the rudders. On the bottom bracket there's two bolts that go through and one of them is actually sheared. Once fixed, it was flat out again. Believe it or not, after 3,000 miles of racing, or nearly 3,000, us, B&B and Aina are all within a few miles of each other. As the wind dropped, conditions were getting tougher. It is absolutely roasting in here. And uh, I'm losing fluids quite quickly. Welcome to the doldrums. Boat speed, pretty much zero. Uh, wind speed, 
That's pretty much so. Despite being first to get back underway, their main competitors were faster in the reaching conditions. It's really not going the way we wanted it at all. Now, our worst fears are met, and these boats are now past us. So it's a um, pretty, um, pretty depressing time, to be honest. Despite keeping their foot to the floor, there was no chance of recovering the lead. Maxime Sorel and Antoine Carpentier had taken first place aboard VMB. With Aymeric Chapelier and Arthur Leveillon taking second aboard Aina Enfance et Avonie. Sharp and Santurde had finished third. But the Class 40 season's overall title was theirs. They'd lost the battle, but had won the war. Last year, over one million people took part in sailing events without getting their feet wet. Many were absolute beginners, racing against the world's best, at high speed, day and night, along coastlines, across oceans and around the world. As e-gaming grows in other sports, virtual regattas simulation games have pioneered online sailing for over a decade. Simulation games mean that you are trying to offer the same experience in the real life, particularly for the, for the intellectual part of sailing, of course. So it means that uh, we reproduce the real world as much as we can. So for example, for the offshore game, we have a, a map, like a Google map, and we put uh, on it uh, the real wind of the real Earth uh, with the weather forecast, and we give you a boat with the same potential of the real boat participating to the race. And plus, we we display the boat of the real race against you. In the last Vendée Globe, almost half a million players took part in the online version of the single-handed around the world race. And now, a major new event has been announced. We have decided to, uh, to organize uh, commonly with World Sailing, uh, the e-sailing uh, world championship. Um, so it will be a championship like you have in the, in the uh, physical world, but it, it will happen in the digital world. The 2018 e-sailing world championships will kick off uh, early in the new year and will culminate with a live final in Sarasota in Florida in November. The main thing I think that it can do for sailing is to introduce it to new audiences it could be a pathway to take those people into the real sport. Francois Gabar has smashed the record for the fastest solo circumnavigation aboard his 30-metre trimaran Massif. His 28,000-mile trip around the world saw him slice more than six days off the record set just 12 months ago by Thomas Coville. His incredible trip set many other records in the process, including a new single-handed 24-hour distance record of 851 nautical miles. Even more impressive is that Gabar's speed is less than two days short of that for the fastest fully crewed circumnavigation. Whichever way you look at it, the numbers for this trip are impressive and will surely remain for some time to come. Sanya, renowned as one of China's premium sailing destinations. Once host to the world-famous Volvo Ocean Race and now to the aspiring stars of the sport at the Youth Sailing World Championships. 374 sailors from 60 nations gathered for a week of racing across nine fleets in five entry Olympic class boats. The Youth World is now in its 47th year and has long been an excellent introduction and training ground for the world of Olympic sailing. This year was no exception. It saw the graduation of hotly tipped potential 2020 medalist Uruguay's Dolores Moreira Fascini. I feel happy on one hand and then sad on the other hand. Now I can fully complete in the senior uh, level. These championships are a really good experience. Of course, it prepares you for the Olympic Games and everything. You, you don't have any other championships when you get these levels. Joining the Youth Worlds this year was helmsman of the Belgian NACRA 15 team, Lucas Claesens, 
At just 14 years old, he was one of the youngest sailors in the competition and at the end of day one was sitting in first place out of a fleet of 18. He and his crew, and Vandenberg, had been sailing together for a mere three months. We have a really good teamwork and mentality. We laugh sometimes because uh, that's how it is. And if we have a bad start, it's like, ah, oh, I know, we have a bad start, but then we start again and we just go for it. The week saw standout performances from nations across the globe. Israel, France, Australia, USA and Italy, to name a few, all had multiple medalists. The Italian 29er girls set the standard for their country on the penultimate day, taking the gold with two races to spare and a huge 27-point lead on their rivals. An all-round performance followed by Italians in the RSX, Laser Radial and 420, and the Italians were awarded the nation's trophy. Hosts China showed their skill on the board. Ting Yu took third in the girls' fleet, and Hua Chen ended up with a silver after a tight fight all week with Israel's gold medalist, Yuav Cohen. A second Youth World Championship trophy wasn't to be for Uruguay's Moreira, just missing out on the top spot to USA Olympic hopeful Charlotte Rose, hoping to medal at the 2024 Games. The positions on the NACRA 15 shifted frequently right up to the last second, with the Swiss team taking the crown. Belgium's Lucas Claessens held his own right up until the final race and he and Anne took the bronze. It's fantastic. We're still very young, so we have still many things to learn. This is a training team that's going to last for a long time. One of the most intense battles was between Britain's Emma Wilson and Italy's Georgia Especial. Match racing down the course, Emma snuck ahead of Georgia to take her second Youth World Championship title. I'm so happy. Oh my God, we sailed so well and it was so close. As the sun set over Sanya's Serenity Marina, the Youth World Championship came to a close. The action-packed event had identified a host of young stars to look out for in the future. Next month, one man's extraordinary trip around the world and a glittering array at the Star Sailors League.